Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. So before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every single Wednesday, as well as upload the video version onto YouTube every Wednesday as well, and you are not going to want to miss it. Now, for today's case, we are covering a solved, heartbreaking, and truly tragic case of Carly Ryan. This is one of those cases that you're going to listen the whole way through and be incredibly frustrated because you're going to have a different perspective on it than what was once had many years ago. And like I said, it's a case of betrayal, it's a case of tragedy, and truly in this day and age with how much we are infiltrated by social media, it is a case that's going to really make you question how well you know the people around you. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Carly Ryan was born on January 31st of 1992 and grew up being raised by her mother, Sonia Ryan, in Stirling, Australia. Sterling is about a 20-minute drive from the very popular town of Adelaide. It's a stunning community that's known to be a very safe place and a great area to raise a family in. Sterling is said to have been built by very wealthy and prestigious families who actually lived in Adelaide and wanted a second home and somewhere to escape the heat, so they would build all of these mansions in Sterling. So that's kind of how the town itself came to be. Now, Carly grew up being the only daughter of her mom. She did have a younger brother, and she was raised by a single mother. Sonia really did her absolute best to raise her children by herself, and her and Carly were the best of friends. The two of them were so incredibly close. Because Sonia was relatively young when she had Carly, she was definitely worried about how she was going to be able to raise a child and make ends meet. However, once Carly was born, Sonia truly felt like she had found her purpose in life, which was to be a mother. And she has said many, many times that Carly really did save her life. Sonia describes Carly as the entertainer of the family. She was always the one who was putting on shows in the living room and trying to make people laugh. She loved to dress up. She loved to tell jokes. And her friends describe her as being full of kindness. She always wanted people to feel included. Carly also loved clothes. She loved makeup. She loved expressing herself in that way and having that outlet. And she really loved gothic clothes and makeup in particular. That was the phase of life that she was in in her early teens. It was something that she really leaned into and something that she truly loved. And as Carly was going into her early teenage years, she was definitely hanging around what would be called, you know, the wrong crowd. The crowd that your parents wouldn't love you to be around. It was her friend's Her friends were the type of people that were experimenting with drugs and drinking alcohol, and Carly definitely got warped into that lifestyle as well. However, everything came to a halt when one night Carly suffered from alcohol poisoning. She told her mom that she was going to distance from her friends. She wanted to step away from that lifestyle and it really scared her. It shook her to her core and she realized that if she kept going the way that she was, she was really setting herself up for failure for her future. So she told Sonia that she was going to be distancing from those friends and Sonia felt relieved. She felt like Carly was really making an effort and an active choice for the betterment of her future. Now, once Carly made the decision to step back from that friend group, she was really starting at square one and was looking anywhere she could to find friends. And for her, that meant looking for friends on social media. 
Now, this is the year 2006, and at the time, MySpace was the overruling social media site. And at one point, fun fact, it was actually the most visited site in the world, even more than Google or anything else. MySpace was the number one site. Now, dependent on how old you are when you were listening to this, some of you may or may not remember it. Facebook was invented in 2004, and MySpace came out one year earlier in 2003. So both of them were very much in their infancy. However, MySpace was definitely the more popular site at the time. Now, Carly decided to make a profile on MySpace, and just to give you a little refresher on what it is from my understanding because I missed out on the MySpace years just by a little bit. But from my understanding, it is a social media site where you can create a profile, you put your interests, you post pictures, and you play music, and you can place your privacy settings to as much or as little as you wanted, giving no one or anyone access to your profile. So it can be as public or as private as you want very similar to Instagram. Now, Carly also signed up for another website, and this one was actually called vampirefreaks.com. This was another social media site with a similar format to MySpace and Facebook, except it was marketed and more geared towards the gothic community and gave people who were interested in that lifestyle a place to connect. And it was on VampireFreaks.com that Carly did end up making a friend. This friend was a 17-year-old boy named Brandon Kane. Brandon went by the username Corrupt Koala, and Brandon told Carly, who, just for reference, was about 14 years old at the time, that he was born in Texas but was living in Victoria, Australia, which is about a five-hour drive from Sterling. Brandon told Carly that he lived at home with his father, Shane, and his brother. Now, right when Carly and Brandon first started chatting, the two connected a lot on different topics. Primarily, they connected on music because Brandon told Carly that he was in a rock band and that was something that Carly was very interested in. And over time, Brandon and Carly started chatting 24-7 and it did not take very long for Carly to develop some very, very strong feelings for Brandon. But before we jump into anything, I think that you're probably sitting here wondering why Knowing what we know now in the social media age, why was Carly allowed such easy access to the internet? Considering all the risks that we know now for a 14-year-old girl to be able to go into these chat rooms and to find, you know, random people all across the world to befriend. And I think that there are a couple different things that I need to touch on before we get into this, because I do think that knowing what we know now, it's very easy to sit here and judge. It's very easy to sit here and say, well, I would never do that now. And you might not have done it back then either, but I do think it's important to talk about the fact that this was a very, very different time. Social media was in the very early developing stages. No one really knew a lot about social media. No one knew a lot about the dangers and the risks behind it. And there were just a lot of unknowns that came along with social media. And the dark side, so to speak, about social media was not really something that was brought to light yet. So for Sonia, Carly's mother, who had previously seen her daughter hang around with, you know, the kids at school that were experimenting in drugs and alcohol, seeing her go from that group of people to, you know, staying at home more, being on the computer, making friends online, the latter actually seemed safer. It seemed better. It seemed more of a controlled environment for Sonia. She didn't have to worry about where Carly was, what she was doing, because she was at home. She was at home on these websites, you know, and that was it. And Sonia didn't just let Carly have a free-for-all. She actually moved the family computer that Carly would use to have these conversations, and she moved it into the kitchen. That way, Sonia would be able to just have a little better grasp on who Carly was talking to, making sure the conversations were appropriate. Those were the types of things that she was looking out for. 
A direct quote from Sonia says, quote, There were no red flags. There was no sexual conversation. There was conversation about how's your schoolwork going? How's your mom? Talking about music. The things that all of her friends were into. End quote. And so again, I think that that just emphasizes the fact that Sonia was aware about the conversations that were being had and seeing that they were appropriate conversations. I think now we can look back and say that it's obvious grooming, you know, and now we have a better understanding on that. But again, at the time, it seemed very harmless. Now, the relationship between Brandon and Carly actually lasted over an 18-month period, so almost two years of this online relationship, and they had never met in person. And again, their conversations were online chatting, and they then transferred over to phone calls. They would spend hours on the phone together, and not only would Carly talk to Brandon, but she would also have conversations on the phone with Brandon's father, Shane. Shane, Brandon's father, worked as a security guard, and over time, the more and more that Brandon would have these conversations with Carly on the phone, Shane seemed to jump in on those conversations more and more each time and this was definitely something that Sonia noticed and thought to be a red flag. She had a very bad feeling about the fact that Shane was constantly jumping in on these conversations, constantly trying to talk to Carly on the phone when she was talking to Brandon, and she told Carly that she had a bad feeling about it, but Carly took that as a threat to her relationship. She didn't want her mom to screw this up for her, and she promised her mom that everything was fine. Sonia said, quote, I discussed with her, something just doesn't seem right about this, and she was just telling me, mom, don't be silly. He's really lovely and cares about me. Please don't ruin my friendship with Brandon. I'm just talking to him. Everything's okay. I promise you, I'll talk to you. End quote. Now, this all brings us to January of 2007. And at this point, Carly was planning her 15th birthday party. She was going to have all of her friends over to her house. Her friend's parents were going to come by. It was going to be a great, fun celebration. And of course, the one person that Carly wanted at this birthday party more than anyone else in the whole world was Brandon. And she was very disappointed when Brandon told her that unfortunately, he was not going to be able to make this birthday party. And obviously, this crushed Carly. And even though she was incredibly disappointed, Brandon actually offered a alternate solution. Brandon told Carly that his dad, Shane, was actually going to be driving through the area due to a job that he had had at his security company and that he would be more than happy to stop off at Carly's birthday party and give her the present that Brandon had bought for her. Now, obviously, when Carly heard this, she was elated because to her, she truly felt like Brandon really, really cared for her. He was going out of his way to have his dad come to her birthday party and he was going to give her this present and it meant the world. Brandon and Carly were on the phone when Brandon had suggested this, and Carly, again, was ecstatic. She ran into the kitchen where her mom was and handed her mom the phone. She wanted Sonia to talk to Shane and ultimately give the green light to let Shane come to her party. Now, when Sonia and Shane got on the phone, Shane had explained that even though Brandon would not be able to make it, he would be more than happy to come to this party, and that way he can meet Carly, Shane can meet Sonia. He thought that it was the perfect plan for everyone. And of course, from Sonia's end, there was a bit of hesitancy to allow this strange man that she does not know to come over to her house for Carly's birthday. It all felt weird. But after speaking to Shane on the phone for a while and really thinking in her head that Carly and Brandon had been talking for so long, it had been almost two years, she changed her perspective 
perspective and felt like maybe this wasn't just some random online person or just some random stranger. This was someone who her daughter really truly cared about and she wanted her daughter to have a great birthday. So ultimately, she allowed Shane to come to the birthday. Now, Carly's birthday party was on January 26th, 2007, and guests had made their way in. Carly's friends had shown up. Everyone was having a great time. And then there was a knock on the door. When Sonia opened the door, it was Shane. Shane was dressed in his security uniform and showed Sonia his badge to prove his identity before walking into the house. When he walked in, he was very friendly with everyone. However, obviously, the one person that was the most excited to see him was Carly. Carly could not wait to talk to Shane. She truly felt like having Shane there was the closest thing to having Brandon there because who is the closest person in Brandon's life to him? It's going to be Shane. It's going to be his father. And the fact that Shane was in her house at her birthday party at 15 years old, this seems like something amazing to her. This is like the best birthday gift ever. When Shane walked through the door and met Carly, the two of them hugged, and Shane gave Carly the birthday gift that apparently was from Brandon, which actually turned out to be lingerie, including underwear and a nurse's outfit. So that was the gift that was given to 15-year-old Carly. And over the course of the night, Sonia definitely noticed that something seemed a little off with Shane. Shane definitely seemed a little too possessive over Carly. He seemed like he was attached to her hip. Every time Carly would go somewhere, Shane would go somewhere. Every time Carly was pulled away to talk to another person, Shane kept his eyes on Carly the whole night, and it was enough for Sonia to notice. Now, at the end of the night, the plan was that Carly was going to have some of her friends spend the night, and they were all going to sleep in her room and have this great big sleepover, and Shane was packing up his things to leave. Now, while he was in the process of gathering his belongings, he told Sonia that his plan was to just get a hotel for the night and drive back to his house in the morning. But when Sonia heard that Shane was planning on getting a hotel, she actually decided to offer the guest room in their house to him instead. She told him that there was no reason for him to have to go spend money on a hotel when they had a perfectly fine guest room that he could stay in and just wake up in the morning and be on his way. Now, obviously, Shane jumped at this idea. He did not hesitate to take Sonia up on this offer, and he was very excited that Sonia would even offer this to him in the first place. Now, the next morning, January 27th, when Sonia had woken up before everyone in the house, she was walking down the hallway past Carly's room when she peeked in and noticed that Shane was asleep on Carly's bed. He was fully clothed and on top of the covers laying next to Carly, and Sonia was absolutely shocked when she saw this and immediately barged into the room, woke Shane up, and demanded that he left the house. Now, Shane did not say anything when he left. There was no apology. There was no explanation, not that there ever would be one or one that is valid, but he did not say anything. He just gathered his belongings and he walked out the door. Now, when Carly woke up, Sonia decided that she needed to have a very serious conversation with her daughter. Sonia told Carly that even though she liked Brandon, even though she had this relationship or whatever it was with Brandon, something was off about this situation. Something was wrong and she didn't feel right about it. She had a gut feeling that this was wrong. And it was actually during this conversation that Carly also confided in her mom and told her that throughout the night at the birthday party, Shane had made several sexual advances at Carly. Carly turned him down each time, however, did it in a joking and playful and polite way because she didn't want it to have an impact on her relationship with Brandon. 
And at this point, Sonia told Carly that the best thing to do would be to cut things off with Brandon for good. She kept repeating to Carly that something was not right about this entire situation and that she needed to end whatever relationship this was with him. Obviously, Carly did not want to do that. She begged her mom to make things right with Shane. She truly felt like one day this could be her future father-in-law and she didn't want what happened at her birthday to mess that up. But at this point, Sonia had had enough. She was looking out for her daughter's best interest. And because she knew that Carly would not voluntarily cut things off with Brandon, she decided to cut off the internet in the house and take Carly's phone away so she would not have access to Shane or Brandon. And when this happened, Carly was absolutely crushed. And even though she did get her phone taken away for some time, she ultimately did get it back. She had to get it back at some point, but it was under the pretense that she would not talk to Shane. Sonia knew that Carly was probably going to reach out to Brandon. She figured that that would be the case. However, she was not allowed to talk to Shane. If Shane were to get on the phone with Brandon, she would need to hang up. If Shane were to communicate with her, she was not to respond. That was the conditions that were laid out. And Sonia even sent Shane an email telling Shane that if he was to ever try and contact Carly again, that she would get the police involved. And Sonia actually received a very harsh email back from Shane. In this email, Shane called Sonia a gutless bitch and claimed that she was defaming him. He even went as far as saying that if Brandon and Carly were to continue their relationship, that Carly would ultimately end up moving in with Shane and Brandon and Sonia would have no contact with Carly ever again, ending the email saying, quote, you lose, bitch end quote. So this all brings us to February 19th of 2017. Sonia and Carly had spent the morning together painting their nails, having a really relaxing morning together. Carly was getting ready for a sleepover that she was going to later that night with her friends. Sonia had been in contact with the girl's parents that Carly was supposed to go over and spend the night with. Everything was confirmed, and Carly was set to have this sleepover later that night. Now, Carly was planning on walking to this friend's house, and when she walked out of the door, Sonia said, quote, she was at the door, and she kind of looked at me in a funny way, and I thought, give me a hug. So I gave her a big hug and then she wanted another one and then she wanted another one. And by the end of it, we had four hugs at the door and she goes, love you, mom, and skipped off the veranda, end quote. And neither Carly nor her mom, Sonia, knew at that time that that would be the last time that they would ever see each other again. The next morning around 9 a.m., Sonia continuously tried to call Carly to see when she was coming home, but her phone was going straight to voicemail each time. Sonia knew that this was very unlike Carly. Carly was glued to her cell phone, mainly because she was always communicating with Brandon. She always wanted to have her phone ready to go if Brandon decided to call. So for Carly to not answer and her phone to go to voicemail, Sonia knew that something was wrong. Sonia had continuously tried to call back several times, and on one of those attempts, the call got intercepted when Sonia received a phone call from an unknown number. When she answered the call, the person on the other end of the line said that they had found Carly's purse on the side of a road in Horseshoe Bay, Port Elliot. Now, this is a beach that's approximately an hour away from Sterling and certainly way further away from where Carly was supposed to be at this sleepover. Now, apparently the person who had discovered the purse had looked inside of it to see if there was an ID or any identification that could lead to giving it back to someone, and they found Sonia's phone number in the purse. 
Now, when Sonia heard that Carly's purse was discovered, she frantically hung up the phone and called the parents of the girl that Carly was supposed to be having this sleepover with. And that is when she learned that Carly never came over the night before. She ended up telling this friend that she was supposed to spend the night with, that she was busy and had to cancel. And the parents never thought anything of it. Now, immediately after hearing this, Sonia hung up the phone and called police to report Carly missing. And it was on this phone call that the police told Sonia that they had already recovered a body in Horseshoe Bay and that the body matches the description of her daughter Carly. Sonia immediately got in her car and drove over to Horseshoe Bay, and it was there that Sonia was able to positively identify the body that they found as Carly. And Sonia said that she didn't believe that there was any way that it could be her daughter when she was driving there. However, when she got there and saw Carly and specifically saw the nail polish that Carly was wearing that the two of them had used just the day before, she knew it was her daughter. Now, when it came to the condition of Carly's body, it was pretty apparent to police right from the very beginning that Carly had been brutally attacked. Carly's body was actually discovered by someone who was just walking on the beach and ended up passing by her and called police immediately. Carly's jewelry was flung all throughout the beach. It was broken. It was all scattered around. And the autopsy revealed that Carly had 19 injuries in total. She had six to eight blunt force trauma wounds to her head. Along with that, they found weed in her bloodstream and sand in her esophagus, leading the medical examiner to believe that her head had been smothered into the sand and she swallowed it while trying to catch her breath during the attack. The official cause of death was a combination of facial trauma, smothering, and drowning. They found blood in the sand and the tip of a latex glove in the area as well. Now, police decided that their first course of action was to look at surveillance footage in the surrounding areas from the night prior. When they did that, they discovered footage of Carly walking with two men in Port Elliott at approximately 7.06 p.m. Police also heard from a witness who claimed that they had seen a girl who matched Carly's description with two men on the beach at approximately 9.30 p.m., and that all of them had come from a pale blue car that was parked in the parking lot. The witness said that he also remembered seeing a security badge with the number 24 on the window of the passenger seat of this car. Now, in the beginning of their investigation, police also went through Carly's cell phone and her computer to see what she had been doing in the days leading up to her disappearance to see if they could puzzle this all together. And they quickly noticed that the only person that Carly really ever had any contact with was Brandon. When going through their messages, it was clear to police that over time, Brandon became very possessive and manipulative. When police asked Sonia about who Brandon was, she told them the whole story. She told them about Shane and she told them about the bizarre behavior at Carly's birthday party. Now, at this point, police wanted to go through Carly's phone records and find the phone numbers that were listed under Brandon's name. However, some of the numbers, because there were several different ones, came from different burner phones. However, one of the numbers did come from a small town in Walkerville. Walkerville, again, is a small town just minutes and miles away from Carly's home. So at this point, police decided to take their chances because they really didn't have anywhere else to turn. So they decided to go to Walkerville, more specifically a caravan park in Walkerville. Police spoke with the manager at the caravan park who were able to confirm that there were two men at this park 
and the description that the manager gave did match the same description as the men that Carly was last seen with. The manager also confirmed that they drove a pale blue car. Now, the manager was able to give police an address that they had on file that the men used when they stayed at the caravan park. They had to give their personal information and they gave their address. And this was the jackpot. This was the missing link that they had been looking for. The address that the caravan park gave police led them to a home in Melbourne. Now, when they arrived at the house, as they were walking up, they discovered that same pale blue car in the driveway with the number 24 badge in the passenger side window. Now, surprisingly enough, when police looked through records, they saw that the home actually did not belong to Brandon Kane or to Shane. It actually belonged to a 48-year-old man named Gary Francis Newman, who just so happened to be the same man who was pretending to be Shane Brandon's father. Now, when police knocked on the door, Gary answered and was immediately arrested and again did not say anything to police. So just to be clear, again, Gary and Shane are the same person. When police got into Gary's house and started looking through everything, they discovered several pieces of note paper that included different usernames and passwords that Gary had written down, and they collectively figured out that Gary had approximately over 200 online personas that he went by, including Brandon and Shane. They have also found other chats on his computer with other teenage girls, and that he was also logged in on the Brandon Kane profile. In the house, they also discovered the fake security uniform that he wore to Carly's house the day of her birthday party. So that was Gary. That was Gary. Gary is Shane. Shane is Gary. It is all the same person, and he has been doing this to countless other people for a very long time, it had appeared. But who was the other boy in the video? Well, that actually just so happened to also be Gary's son. Police had theorized that Gary had actually enlisted his 17-year-old son to help play the part of Brandon to make this whole plot more convincing and to lure Carly in. Police were also able to put together a theory of what they believed to have truly happened the night of Carly's murder. They believed that Gary was talking to Carly under the Brandon Kane profile and convinced Carly to meet up with him and Brandon instead, knowing that this was not an offer that she would refuse. And obviously, when Carly heard that Brandon was going to be there, she was ecstatic and couldn't wait to meet Brandon, and she promised that she wouldn't tell her mom. Police believed that once the three of them met up, they all went to the beach in Horseshoe Bay and Gary made several advances towards Carly, which she refused. It is at that time that police believe that Gary hit Carly over the head, which is where she fell onto the ground face first, and they believe that he began suffocating her by burying her head into the sand. It is believed that afterwards, while Carly was unconscious, that Gary threw her body into the water before driving away. Forensic experts believe that Carly was alive and tried to fight back for approximately 30 minutes of her attack. And while it is unknown how much both Gary and his son had to do with the attack itself, there was sand found in both of their shoes. And obviously that is the crime scene was this beach. Now, the name and identity of this son, the 17-year-old son, has always to this day remained sealed. And for a long time, Gary also went unidentified as well, but we will get into that in a second. Now, Gary also has an older son. So he has this 17-year-old son, and then he has an older son. And according to this older son, this older son actually knew what his dad was doing and tried to stop him. According to this older son, who also goes unnamed and unidentified, he claimed that when Gary and the 17-year-old got back from Adelaide, they were boasting about what they had done to Carly. So after the murder, they were boasting about what had happened to Carly and what they had done. The older brother, 
So the one who was not a part of it claimed, quote, my father showed me his knuckles and asked, do these look bruised to you? He told me that he had punched Carly Ryan in the face and that he had killed her and that he had, quote, done the job. He said that he punched her in the face, pushed her head into the sand, and after that, he threw her in the water, end quote. Now, the 17-year-old also told his brother that him and Carly had hooked up. However, the brother took that as that the two of them just kissed and went no further. Now, the oldest son also said that the day that Gary got back from the birthday party after he had been kicked out of the house, he got back to his home, his sons were both there, and Gary was angry. Gary had actually inquired for both of his sons to go to Adelaide and Horseshoe Bay with him so they could all three quote-unquote fix up Carly. That is what Gary had told his sons. He said quote, he wanted me to help him while he was there to help him kill her. Now, according to the eldest son, he was so deeply disturbed by his dad and what his dad was planning on doing that he actually ended up moving out of the house. And when he did, he left Gary a note, which essentially told him that if he continued down the path that he was going, that he was going to lose both of his sons. And he said that he tried to use this letter to help persuade his dad to not kill Carly. However, clearly, that did not happen. It is just very unfortunate because had this brother, instead of writing a note, reached out to the police, maybe things could have been different. And that's not to pin any blame onto anyone. And I'm sure that if the chance was given a different, you know, a different direction, a different route would have been taken. But it is upsetting to see. Now, Gary first appeared in court in October, and he had asked to plead to manslaughter, which the prosecution denied. Gary actually blamed his 17-year-old son for what had happened to Carly, saying that his son was the one who was communicating with Carly the whole time. His son was the one who attacked Carly, but very quickly this was debunked. And like I mentioned earlier, Gary's identity actually also went unknown for quite some time until his identity identity was released to the public and the reason it was was because the public had demanded that whoever was responsible for such a heinous crime that there's no reason to protect them there's no reason to protect their identity and the public wanted to know just in case anyone else had encountered Gary before and just in case he got released into in the future people wanted to know so ultimately his identity was released however again his son to this day his identity has remained unknown now in January 2010 Gary was sentenced to life in prison with a 29 non-parole period. So that was Gary's charge. However, his son, who was older than 17 at this point, his son was cleared of all charges, which I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to think about that because I don't know how I feel about that. Truth be told, I feel like he was a part of it. I understand that his dad probably, you know, his dad was the, I understand that his dad was the more dominating one in the duo and that his dad, you know, probably he just, he led him down the path with him. However, it just doesn't really sit right with me, but let me know what you guys think. So that is Gary and his son. And after the trial was over, and to this day, even now, Sonia has spent these past few years trying to continue Carly's legacy. She started the Carly Ryan Foundation, which is a nonprofit charity that's goal is to promote internet safety. And the foundation also created a smartphone app called Thread, which is a personal safety app for children. Now, Sonia has also received a South Australian of the Year Award in 2013 for the services that she has provided to the community, and she has won several more awards as well. She has done multiple speeches. You can find them online, but that, you guys, is the case of Carly Ryan. I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. Do you think the son should have gotten any sort of punishment for what had happened? What do you think about Gary? What do you think about the situation 
as a whole. I'm very curious. So let me know in the comments below. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday. You're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys.